right? Um, next talk coming up. Taylor is going to tell us about WebAssembly mm -hmm. and how it fits in our future. Welcome, Taylor. Oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, audience plants. Um, so, um, yeah, I am Taylor Thomas, and this talk is called WebAssembly, a recovering Kubernetes engineer's view of the future. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, some of you are repeat, actually, I'm just gonna ask this question right now. How many of you were at the talk that Brooks and I gave this morning? Okay, half the audience, good. That helps me gauge what I need to repeat and what I don't need to repeat. Um, so yeah, I am a director of engineering at Cosmonic. Um, big in the Rust community, contributed in a lot of different languages, but Rust is my favorite. Um, I'm a co-creator of the Crustlet project and Bindle, um, as well as an open source maintainer and an emeritus Helm maintainer and core project maintainer for Wasm Cloud. So, um, I want to give a little bit of history about myself. Normally, I don't like to talk too much about myself, but this matters in context of this talk. So, I got started with Kubernetes and Docker around version 0 0.6 of, of Docker and Kubernetes since like 1.2. So, it's been a lot, I've been there since towards the beginning of both of them. Um, I built Kubernetes platforms at Intel and then Nike, and then I built, helped build AKS at Microsoft. And I was a core maintainer of Helm for four years. Um, I wrote a pretty decent chunk of Helm 3, if you're a heavy Helm user. Uh, and my deepest, darkest confession in the Kubernetes world is I wrote the wait flag. Um, whether, if you know, you know. Um, I, I regret that every day. Um, so yeah, that's my deepest, darkest secret. But all of this is just the, the long way of saying basically like, I, I get it. Like, I, I understand the pain points of Kubernetes. I understand the strengths of Kubernetes. I've used it in all sorts of unholy and terrible ways, and I've used it in all sorts of really good ways. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in context of WebAssembly, because it always comes up, especially as we're here around KubeCon. So what's this WASM thing? Sorry for those of you who attended the beginning. Some of this will be a little bit of a repeat. I'm going to make sure everybody understands, and I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it, but there's these five things up here that are the, the critical points to understand. Um, this is what, WebAssembly is neither web nor assembly, it's not either one of the things, but it was adopted by the web first for these reasons up here. Um, we like open things, it's small, safe, and secure, it can be compiled to from any language, and it's portable, runs anywhere. Those, those things that make WebAssembly good for the browser also make it very, very good for the server, right? We want things to be open standards. We have things in the in foundations for that reason. We want default, uh, basically sandbox by default. We want things completely closed off. Um, we, have th we want to have things that are efficient and fast. And we want things that are also functional in any language. And then we also want it to be able to run anywhere. We're gonna talk a little bit more about each of those things. But let's talk a little bit about like what it can be used for first. What can WebAssembly be used for right now? Um, or what we think it's the best for? Uh, one of the things is microservices. So general server-side computing. So microservices, functions as a service, runtime optimization. Uh, those kind of things are very, very good for WebAssembly. You can choose your runtime and how you compile WebAssembly at the actual point of running it. So you can choose whether you want to do JIT, interpreted, AOT. You can also choose whether or not you want to use an optimized runtime for a embedded device or a general purpose runtime. All of these things are decided um, at the very, at the like the very last possible moment. Um, constrained devices, as many of you heard me say this morning, I'm the edge with very large air quotes. Nobody actually knows what the edge is anymore, but in this case, I'm meaning constrained devices or devices that are further out from your normal data centers. For some people, edge can even mean their own data centers, but f for here, like, it's very good on running on those tiny devices. It's also very good for plugins, especially with the changes that are coming with the component model. Uh, plugins and libraries. It has the potential to be the last plugin model we'll ever need and one of the best ways we can share libraries with each other. And then of course, it's very good in the browser. Just ask big companies like Autodesk or Adobe or those people who have like AutoCAD and Photoshop and all those things. All those that run in the browser are almost certainly using WebAssembly because it's more performant than trying you know, to write image transforms in JavaScript. So one of the things I want to mention before, this is just, it's an aside, I mentioned this partially in our, in our last talk, but I'm gonna just a little bit deeper here, is this idea of the component model. Um, this is what enables us to have libraries and enables us to have um, these kind of plugin systems. 
And the idea of the component model is everything works using an interface. Um, each of these interfaces are, uh, are defined, and if you are able to share them, then anybody can use that interface. So we already have some group effort around this in the WASM community uh, called WASI Cloud. Um, and the idea is like, here, these Lego, these Lego blocks are a perfect example. Let's say you have an HTTP, HTTP proxy everything has to go for. If you're using Envoy, your HTTP proxy could be using Envoy underneath the hood, and then you have like your open tracing stuff and things on top of it. But also, you could have, at your big company, you could have your own custom sort of stack that's going on, or your own custom HTTP proxy, and you can plug it in. Everything becomes just basically little Lego bricks you can put together to make the final thing you're gonna use. Um, they're, they're easily swappable. And so that's what the component model allows you to do. So is here's an interface, do you satisfy this interface? Then if yes, I can combine you. And did something happen with my, okay, perfect. Whew. Okay, so what are the pain points inside of WebAssembly right now? Um, networking is still difficult. We're moving along quickly though. Um, we have things that have, that we had WASI sockets land six months ago or so and those are starting to come in. We have a lot of work around and a standardized like HTTP contract that's going on for the component model. Um, things very much are in the fast moving stage. They will bleed, I call it the hemorrhaging edge. It's not even the bleeding edge, it's the hemorrhaging edge. Um, you will get cut and you will bleed just because if you're doing all the latest things because it's just so new. Um, from an execution speed standpoint, you're never gonna get as fast as native code with WebAssembly. I think it'll get closer and closer as people start doing all sorts of crazy optimizations with it. But right now, if you're trying to do super performant low level system code, it might not be the thing you're gonna wanna use. And then just the tool chains aren't really there yet for some languages. That's getting better, honestly, week over week at this point, but there are still things where if you just try to go, hey, I really love my Python, and then you just try to compile the WebAssembly, you're probably gonna run into a bunch of problems. Python is getting there and it's very close, but you have to know some of the rough edges. Now, we have this tool called Wasm Cloud, and to make it very clear, Wasm Cloud is an open source project. Everything is entirely out there in the open. It's owned by the CNCF. Um, my company, Cosmonic, we're major contributors to it, and we, we do stuff with it for our company. But Wasm Cloud is an application runtime. And sorry, once again, this is a review for those who came this morning, but runtime versus application runtime is an important distinction. Think Docker versus Kubernetes, or um, JavaScript versus React. One allows you to build applications, and yes, you can build applications with lower level blocks, but it's a lot harder. You have to do a lot more manual assembly. It's the same thing with WebAssembly runtimes. Wasm Cloud is the thing that lets you run applications easier on top of a WebAssembly runtime. And we use distributed capability driven development, which I'm gonna show just mostly how this all works through demos. Um, and explain some more about the, the different points there. So that's where Wasm Cloud comes in. So I want to go ahead and talk about, um, talk about just like a basic overview of Wasm Cloud, what it does, and why, why it matters here for this conversation. Then we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in context of Kubernetes. So over here, um, this is what we call the washboard. It is our built-in dashboard that comes with Wasm Cloud. I actually will go ahead and just show you how easy this is to work. I'm running some specific versions for testing, but I can just run our command line tool. Come on, bigger, bigger, bigger. There we go, sorry. Okay, so I can just run our, our command line tool for, for Wasm Cloud, which is called wash, and I can say wash up is the most generic one. Um, I haven't updated the latest version, so I'm making sure I'm pulling down the latest Wasm Cloud version, and it's gonna go ahead and start everything up for me, and it's all running. And then I'll have this washboard available for me to look at. So I'm going to do the most simple of all demos. This is the same demo that we showed earlier, but I'm gonna do it in a, do a couple things in, a, in some different ways. I'm gonna go ahead and start from the registry, our key value server. So this is um, Wasm Cloud. It's at four, right, Brooks? 0 0.4, I always forget when I'm on stage. Okay, good. We'll give that a second, it's gonna download. Okay, there we go, so that pulled down from an OCI registry. It's not a container, it's just stored in an OCI registry, and I started one of these up. I'm also going to go ahead and start the uh, Redis provider, the Redis, sorry, the Redis server. Um, version on that again, Brooks, because I'm having a hard time remembering right now. 19, 19 thank you. Um, 
I'm just showing you this all manually so you see like everything that's going on here. So we'll give that a second. Once again, we're gonna hope the Wi-Fi is not, not slow. I, have, I had it cached, but we'll see if it stays cached around. So I'm gonna start that up, and then I'm gonna start up a Redis server locally. This looks very similar to what you do most of the time. Um, like if you're doing local development. So I just started Redis locally. I have this Redis key value store working. And so before I do this next step, so I have what's called an actor. This is your business logic. This is where the actual code is at. Then I have a provider. This gives me a connection, it's a dependency. So in what we've done in Wasm Cloud is we've pulled out all these dependencies so that they're no longer part of your code. And when we look at the actual code involved here, um, this will look familiar if you were here this morning, it is a simple saying, I am an HTTP server. I don't care what gets me the HTTP request, I just want an HTTP request. There's no port setting up, there's no there's not that same 10 lines you copy from every Go project to get your server going, there's none of that stuff. And then down here I say, hey, there's this key, I need to talk to a key value store, so I'm just gonna talk to a key value store, once again, it's not, there's no connection strings, there's no clients, there's no anything. It's just saying, I, I would like to talk to a key value store, I don't care which one. So that's all the code is. That's 49 lines of code to give us this KV counter. Um, and so now what I do is at runtime, because it doesn't, it's not connecting anything, I have to do a link definition. And so this thing I say, hey, I'm gonna connect these two things together and I'll go ahead and I actually don't have to add it. I can add some configuration, but I'm just gonna let it connect to localhost. So that's automatically gonna put everything together. Everything started up for me. And so now I can go to um, here and define one more link, which is with, oh, I need to start it. Huh. It'd help if I start the thing. Okay, so in this case, I'm starting an HTTP. There was, dang it. It's gonna tell me an error in a second, so. There we go. Should take it a second and should be up. Okay, so now we have an HTTP server and I'm gonna define a link between that. So I'll say KV counter, HTTP server, And this one, I'm gonna give it some configuration. I'm gonna give it an address of 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0, we'll say 8081. Sure, why not? Okay, all of that's there, so now I can go to localhost 8081. Ta-da, okay, so I just took that code that you saw, had nothing to do with Redis, none of that thing, and I said, hey, connect me to Redis, connect me to an HTTP server, and now I can increment this, this key value store. This demo is purely to show you the basics of what's going on here. So this is, this is, web, this is all powered by WebAssembly. That code is WebAssembly. It can run on any system, and I'm gonna start showing how this all, all connects in. So we're gonna do that, but first, before we go back to this demo, I'm gonna talk about what is, how, how do Wasm and Kubernetes play together here, and then demo something even cooler than what I was just showing. So let's uh, bust a few myths first. Uh, these are some common questions and statements I've heard from people as I've, as I've talked to people out in the community. The first one is, is Wasm going to kill containers? If I had a dime for every time, sorry, if I had any money, I'm not in the US, shouldn't use US currency, but if I, if I got money every single time I had this question asked, I'd be a very rich person. But WebAssembly is not going to kill containers. We're ev this is evolutionary. Um, you're, we're not going, like there's things that just run better in containers right now and sometimes you, you already have stuff set up for containers or it's just easier for you to, there's, there's all sorts of requirements. This isn't going to be a container killer. I do think, however, that lots of applications will be written in WebAssembly as opposed to containers in the future, particularly microservice based ones. So that's the first myth. The second one is, hey, I should just run my WebAssembly in containers. No, you shouldn't. Um, that kind of is defeating the whole point. WebAssembly offers you the sandboxing, the cross-platform, all that stuff you'd expect. But if you take that and you, you, have, you have a slight overhead because it's not native code, and then you wrap that in a Docker container which adds more overhead, and then you often put that inside of Kubernetes, I mean you kind of just wrapped it in a bunch of cruft it doesn't need. So don't just run your WebAssembly in containers. There's other projects which I'm gonna mention here if you wanna run like WebAssembly directly in Kubernetes that you can use that are gonna be more efficient. 
Um, the other, the other thing I always hear is WASM and the various runtimes of WASM are in, and Kubernetes are in competition with each other. Uh, also no, and I'm going to show that exactly why. People have invested a lot in Kubernetes. There's good things for Kubernetes to do here, and we don't want to just, it's not, it's not competition here. They actually can help each other out and help get to places that each of the others can't as easily. So what can you do now with Kubernetes and WebAssembly? Uh, you can use RunWASI. The RunWASI project is a really cool project uh, from that I think a lot of people at Microsoft and the Deus Labs team worked on, and then a couple other people in the community. And it essentially runs, if you're familiar with the Kubernetes underlying sp stuff, you have container D shim. It's essentially running a container D shim underneath the hood that instead of being container D, it's running um, WASI runtimes. So this is, this is a way you can do it, still run it like it's a normal pod and run WebAssembly underneath the hood. Also, if you've never noticed before, things like Envoy already have WebAssembly in it. You can build filters in WebAssembly and use it as a, as a plugin. So it's already there. And then we can also use Wasm Cloud, and I'm going to show that today, uh, how you can use Wasm Cloud with Kubernetes. Now let's go to the other side. What, is, what does WebAssembly do better than Kubernetes? It is going to run smaller for you. End of story. Um, let, let's put it this way. Uh, you have, it, well, first off, let's start with the, some, some numbers we've seen. Most equivalent applications, it's hard to do apples to apples, but most equivalent applications in a well-maintained Docker container versus in WebAssembly, the WebAssembly is about a tenth of the size. So if something is 20 megabytes and you've done all the work to keep it really small and it's on Alpine or whatever, you, or Scratch, you can get it down to like 20 megabytes. That same thing running in WebAssembly is going to be about two megs or less. So it's a lot smaller, and that means faster download times. It also runs a lot quicker because you don't have the overhead of the Docker container, uh, or the Docker container in there. But also, let's let's uh, have a real talk. The default max pod limit for a Kubernetes node is 110 pods. Even if we assume there are five containers in every single pod, which is a bit ridiculous. You have five containers in every single pod. That's 550 containers you can run on a single node. One of these, I actually was testing something and it broken an algorithm <laughs> the other day. I scaled it up to 6,000 of these things running on my machine simultaneously without blowing up. Nothing froze. I didn't come to a screeching halt. Like that, there's a massive amount of scale here that you can gain from, from WebAssembly. It's also entirely sandboxed. Um, Docker, and especially Kubernetes by default, is not like very, there's a bunch of security policies, there's a bunch of things you have to do to really lock it down. By default, WebAssembly can do nothing unless you give stuff to it. It's also entirely cross-platform. We've been deceiving ourselves for years by saying, Docker lets me run things anywhere. No, it doesn't. It, if you want to actually run a Docker container everywhere, you have to build uh, a container for every single architecture. And that's not even to start to mention the fact that there's a difference between Linux containers and Windows containers. Containers for Mac don't even exist. Um, there's, there's no cross-platform. WebAssembly, a lot of the modules that we like have built have been built on Macs or random Linux machines or Windows boxes, doesn't really matter. They all are able to, to build and run anywhere. And then the edge. Kubernetes is not very good at the edge. Now I'm going to be, I'm going to first shout out to the K3S team and the people at, like the people at Rancher who did that. It's an amazing project. They've done a, a crap ton of work to make that so easy to use on smaller devices. But really, for production use cases, it's very hard to run Kubernetes at the edge. Kubernetes is meant to live in the same like localized data center. And I know people have done work to do it out there, but it really starts to break down and become very complex when you, when you take it out of there. If you want to connect multiple devices, for example, if you're a telco and you need to connect to things on cell towers or power company and you need to connect to devices running in your, in your power distribution nodes or people who are running embedded devices in stores or whatever it might be, Kubernetes doesn't cover that very well. There's a lot of work required to make it, make it actually play, to play well together. And then there's this thing I like to call the lower bound problem, for lack of a better term. Um, 
you're talking about cold start speeds, and I'm, I'm not getting into the nitty gritty of, oh, well, this is four milliseconds versus 20 milliseconds. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like, just think about the day-to-day -day operations. If you need to move something close to a customer, and this is, this is real life stuff we talk to people about, Fortune 100 companies who come in and they say, I need to get this thing close to my user. It needs to have fast response time. The time to get a container up and then respond to a request is often larger than about 200 to 300 milliseconds, and that matters. There's a just, it, Wasm can start up quicker, clean up quicker, and use less resources than what you're going to get with containers. So that's what WebAssembly does better than Kubernetes. But here's a possible view of the future. Um, that I'm hoping to, like this, these are just the future according to Taylor. So all of these are probably gonna be wrong within six months, but I'm gonna say them anyway. Um, the first thing is that I, I truly think that all functions as a service platforms will become WebAssembly based. Instead of having to add custom like Docker container runtimes that know how to run language X, Y, or Z, what if you just take something that compiles to WebAssembly or just a WebAssembly binary that can be written in any of these languages and run it? So I think that in the future, that's gonna be functions as a service. Um, I also think many true microservices, and by true microservices, I don't mean your super large Java thing that runs with 20, megs, or 20 gigs of memory that you dumped into a Docker container. That's not a microservice. I'm talking about true microservice architectures. I think those are gonna become WebAssembly modules over containers. Um, I also think that WebAssembly is going to be the uh, plug-in model to rule them all, uh, especially with the landing of components. And then I think there are going to be a whole bunch of newer waves of platforms um, or tools that are built directly on top of WebAssembly that leverage its ability to be distributed everywhere. So with that in mind, let's talk about WebAssembly and Kubernetes in action. So I just showed you this local demo that, that showed everything running. I'm gonna go ahead and, and actually like spin that down. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm gonna start showing you this in Cosmonic. This is not a product pitch, it's just Cosmonic is, Wasm, is running Wasm Cloud for you and it has a nice UI for me to show you what's going on, makes all this easy. So first thing we're gonna do is, this is what we had, okay? I had like my laptop that was running a provider, had the KV counter that was talking to another provider, talking to Redis on my local machine. And we're gonna spread it out to this. So I actually was going to be running this on DigitalOcean, then made a last minute ch choice to switch it to AKS for fun and profit, so I know that says DOKS, but this works anywhere. So I'm going to run something inside of, of Kubernetes and then have something running in Cosmonic and show this all work for us. So um, what we're gonna go ahead and do is come over here and say, so here's my Cosmonic dashboard. I have a node running that's hosted by Cosmonic. And then we have two different ways. If you're doing Wasm Cloud, um, just plain open source, we have a Helm chart that, like I said, Helm maintainer, so I wrote a Helm chart. And so the Helm chart is in here and you can actually use this to do exactly what I'm doing. Um, inside of Cosmonic, we just, we just actually added something that we're not technically announcing to tomorrow, so you all get a preview um, called Cosmo Connect. And so this is just going to set everything up for me. Um, and it's going to connect to my, my AKS cluster that's running. It's gonna start some resources for me. It'll take about 20 or 10 or 20 seconds more and it'll be all up. Meanwhile, um, we'll go ahead and run, oh perfect, there, it's all done. So if we come over here, it'll take me a second, probably because of the internet, yep, there we go. And then you'll see that there's two Kubernetes, uh, two hosts running inside of Kubernetes. And then it's also spun up a couple other things to make everything happen automatically for me, these things down here. And so I'm going to go ahead and start up um, the KV counter actor over here. Let's go ahead and, there we go, sorry. So I'm gonna start up the KV counter and I'm gonna run it just so you know it's running like on the Cosmonic Managed Host, you can see it here. I'm gonna launch it. Give it just a second to spin up. Okay, now it's up and running. So I'm gonna say, let's say connect this up to, I need an HTTP server for it. But I wanna connect it to something running in Kubernetes. So I'm gonna connect it to my Kubernetes HTTP servers that are running. This is just an automatic routing layer that's there. And I'm gonna give this one of 8081 as well. We'll do 8081. Okay, so we can create the link. And we can actually come over here and say kube control get service. 
Hey, look, there it is. We're going to be uh, making these nicer names. That's just the ID of the, uh, yeah, I know, I see the laughter out there. Don't worry, we're going to make those nice names. This is the ID of the, of the code that it's running to. So every single one of these has an ID that's like right here. You'll see it's the same thing that's down here. Um, and so anyway, we're going to make that a nicer name. But right now, it happens automatically, spins it up, has the right port ready to use. And so what I can do is take this and can say um, kube control run. I'm, I'm do this just so you know, I am not pretending. I am starting just a, a pod right here, and I'm going to literally do an app update, apt install curl right in front of you, so there ain't no lion going on. And we'll let that install for a second. We'll take, yeah, there we go. And we're going to have it. So we'll, while that's running, I'm going to go ahead and say, I need to connect this to a key value store. Um, now, I can run this inside of Kubernetes, but I accidentally deleted that pod. So we're going to change this, and I'm going to connect it to my local laptop running here. So I could have this. I'm going to start at this provider. You're going to notice it's the same thing. I'm going to say, oh, I actually have to do one more thing. You can also, over here with our Cosmo tool, say this is the same thing. Once again, can do this with, with normal open source WebAssembly. I'm just going to connect my local machine to um, Cosmonic as well. So it's going to take a second while it sets it up, and there we go. Okay. So, yep, I have a new, it even told me I have a new host, and it just created everything. And then I'm going to spin up a provider on that host, KV Redis. And just so you know, I'm doing it again. We're going to say OS is Mac. Sweet. Connected that up. Okay, so now I have this running there. And I'm going to connect it up to that key value store. I'm not going to provide any configuration, just so it's there. And now it's all set up. So now we're going to go back to um, my uh, temp thing over here. And I'm going to say, OK, I, have, I should have curl now. So um, curl, OK, right, there's the ID. And then um, API. Oh, I forgot the V. It's API, right, Brooks? Yep. Let's see what it's doing. Uh, yep, I am. Thank you. See, this is, in case, once again, in case you didn't think it was a real demo, I'm missing the port. OK, 8081 slash API. OK, perfect. So I should, I think I have to set default for this one. Is that what it is, Brooks, for counter? Did I do that wrong? Okay, anyway. Is that right? Hold on, this is where I go double check my own code because apparently I forget it. API counter, there we go. Ha! Counter, okay. Perfect. There we go. So you'll notice the counter is seven. That's because I just hit the counter before on my local machine. So this is a Kubernetes cluster running in, I think I ran it in US, uh, like east somewhere. Kubernetes cluster running there, my laptop here with the database on it, and then a pod. This, that pod, I'm just using that pod as if it were a Kubernetes service. So that could be anything you're already running in a container can now talk to this service and then, uh, and then hook into the logic you're already using. So. This is a very powerful pattern because you're starting to like extend things out to the edge. And I could, um, I could also try to do uh, a Redis. Let me see if I can remember the command. I... There we go. Perfect. I'm going to install Redis on my Kubernetes cluster real quick. Um, when, when while that's running, OK, there we go. Perfect. Should be up. So kube control get pods. Uh, it's still going to pend for a second. So we'll go back to that. So I'm going to actually swap out to another thing just to show. So we, we went through, I had to change from a Redis database running in Kubernetes to a Redis database running on my local host. And I'm going to go ahead and swap this out and say, you know what, like, okay, I'm running this KV counter on Cosmonic, but what if I went ahead and deleted this and said, you know what, I'm going to run this, this KV counter on my local machine. So once again, we'll go to find host and say, make sure this is on my Mac, please. 
So then now it's started up. We'll take a second and then it'll be started up. Okay, now it's all started up and it's still running locally. And I can come back into the, the pod and should get eight, because now I'm, yep, eight. Okay, so now I just, I just completely moved my computer around without changing code, without changing configuration, without changing anything else. And then I could also do something like this and say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna swap out my provider. I'm gonna use the one that's built into Cosmonic. Or I could be using, um, I could be using like DynamoDB, or I could be using Cosmos DB, or I could use whatever it might be. I, so I'm going to change this out to, oops, not the wormhole. Uh, Built-in key value, there we go. So I'm going to start this up, and now I'm going to take it, as soon as it starts up, perfect. And I'm going to delete this one and say, you know what, I'm going to change where it's linked from to from here to here. Create link. And I can come back, and this value is going to be probably much higher because I've done this before. Oh, no, five. Sweet, it's new. So perfect. So now, now I'm doing this with, now I just changed it again. So I'm still running the service in Kubernetes. I've changed databases. I've changed where it's running. And I've just shifted this all around. Um, however I wanted to. So you can see how this could be really useful. If you want to take advantage of some of those cool things I was talking about with WebAssembly, I know you don't want to rewrite your whole application. No one does. But like you're, you might be rewriting one significant part of your service or one small part that's like the thing that costs you the most money. And you can run it in WebAssembly using like Wasm Cloud and then just automatically extend it out to the edge. We've extended it out to my laptop here. This could be a Raspberry Pi. This could be whatever I want it to be. So. Um, and that kind of shows that full flow. So um, what we're going to do is, I'm just running out of time, so I'm going to close it up here so we have time for questions. Um, I have, I'm leaving myself a little bit more time. So for those who attended the last talk, uh, I gave these points, but I want to talk about them one more time in context of this. So what could you do now? What can you actually do? First thing is what, like I mentioned, you can start with that small service, whatever that thing might be, and move it over. Um, you can do it in, in Wasm, and with these things that allow you to connect to Kubernetes, you don't have to change any of your other services. You might have to change which service it's talking to, right? The, auto, the automatically created service that, that we do for you, you have to create that maybe. But then you could also do one part of a service. You could move part of it over and have all of these talking back and forth. You can also have stuff running in WebAssembly talk back to Cosmonic. Or sorry, WebAssembly talk back to, like running Cosmonic talk back to um, talk back to Kubernetes, or you could have it running in just plain Wasm. Like I said, this is all entirely available in the open source. And then you could also have a full stateful application, which we showed one of those earlier today with a, with a pet clinic example, where you could run the whole thing on Wasm. So that's what you could do now. So with that, I have these up. These are the la same ones I had in the last talk as well. If you want to join the um, Wasm Cloud Slack, it's on the left. And on the right, we have the landing repo for Wasm Cloud itself. But I want to leave time for some questions here at the end, so I think there'll be a few. We have one back there. Thanks. Um, with your managed product that you demoed, mm -hmm. what, what technology are you using for your networking? Networking is NAT. So underneath the hood, it's all like, that. It, that's not for the managed product, that's for everything. So Wasm Cloud uses NATs underneath the hood as its connecting layer. Um, and then we have a, what we have in Wasm Cloud, and once again, this is all the open source stuff, is um, a bunch of signing and other things that go along to make sure everything's secure in between each of these things. But we use NATs underneath the hood to connect everything. So you, what? Serializing TCP connections over NAT, so you, um, it, de you it depends on the thing. Yeah. There, there is an RPC protocol in place here. Um, right now, I think we're on. I think we might use Message Pack underneath the hood still, and so um, that's that's what we're using right now. This is going to keep changing and being even more efficient with the advent of. Um, basically components, because components are, have their own like lifting and lowering logic, so we can essentially go down to bytes across a wire and then translate it on the other ends. So those are our, those are our things we're heading for right now, but yeah, underlying network stuff, we keep that as optimized as we can, um, but obviously there is still a penalty technically, but we, we keep it, it's still pretty efficient, all things considered. Um, it's not any slower than anything you would do like Kubernetes that's spread across multiple areas. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Thank everyone, you. for coming. Have a great rest of your day.